Hey, okay, now I can hear you. There we go. Nice. How it goes? Good. Good. How's it going? It's great. Nice to meet you. A friend of Kaya's, friend of mine. She's amazing. (laughs) She's like on top of it big time. Exactly, exactly. It came out of the blue. I mean, we did our interview, uh, uh, God, 2017. Wow. So Nice. She must have known that we were supposed to meet. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, I'm, you know, I'm like a 25, 30 year meditator. So, you know, nice. like I said, where I'm, you know, I'm a, an advocate for psychedelics and things, but it's, it's all tied together with my meditation and, you know, just sort of my theory that you got to go inside to get answers and healing. So yeah, you know, it's, it's either you're meditating, you're breathing, you're taking some catalyst, but you got to get there. Yeah, exactly. And I think many people are really scared to go inside. Would you agree? Yeah, I, I do. I don't know if – are you recording this to this point? Or are we yeah, I mean, we can edit it anytime. Yeah, let's okay. just start. Okay. Why not? Okay, cool. So, uh, yeah, so um, I think, you know, when, when you talk about uh, going inside of yourself, since we've never been taught formally like we are math or – physical education, it can be intimidating, even meditation that sounds, you know, so benign, people like, Oh, God, I don't know if I can do it. And they get anxious. And same thing with psychedelics, you know, you have this situation where, you know, it's going to be something different than you've dealt with before. So you're kind of like, wow, this could change everything. And I think a lot of times, you know, even meditation, can be intimidating because you know it's going to open up some part of you that's different than you've experienced before and then you're going to have to live with that you know new knowledge that new direct experience so it's i think it can be intimidating and i think you would probably agree with this that you're probably not um surprised by anything or, or surprised by everything. The, the, what I'm going for is, I totally hear what you're saying. There have been times that I've had meditations that have shifted my entire perception of reality. Yes. And, uh, and pardon me, you know, I just think about it. I'm like, hmm, okay, cool. And I just embrace it. And I'm like, oh, that's how I am. But I would imagine, I, there are even some things I don't talk about on Zen Commuter because I'm thinking people will be like, whoa, I'm not ready for that yet. And, uh, mm-hmm. But I think, meditation helps me get to that point. Do you think it's the case with everybody uh, to get to that acceptance of like, well, that's not something I really understand, but you know what? Here it is. I'm here. Yeah. I, well, I think it's, it's all about the direct experience, you know, because if you talk about meditation and you, you know, read books about it or whatever, that's one thing. It's like, you know, when you're trained properly and all of a sudden during your meditation, you transcend to that state of, you know, uh, whether you want to call it God consciousness or universal consciousness, it's like when you hit that, you have this amazing experience. You're like, wow, like this is it, you know? And I have had the same thing myself and other people in their psychedelic experiences where you're expecting one thing and then you get the direct experience and it's so powerful. I mean, a, you know, a meditation Uh, I've had some of those too, where you're just all of a sudden, you're just in this transcended place and you're like, wow, like this is um, the whole universe and I'm a speck of dust, you know? And so it's just an awesome thing that we could do it naturally. The place that I differ, I think from some other people is that I think it would be great if everybody could just meditate and get there. But, you know, right now we're living in this society, this culture that's moving so fast. There's so much trauma and PTSD, fear that, you know, if somebody just came back from Iraq and you say, oh, no problem, just sit down and meditate, it's going to be great. They might not be able to get there. And people with, you know, sexual trauma, or maybe even just some pattern that they inherited in their brain, they can't get there. They need some kind of catalyst to like slam them through. And what I've noticed is in my own meditations, I've been meditating for almost 30 years. Uh, Thankfully, somebody taught me a mantra based meditation back then. And I've been doing it every day since. And it's part of my lifestyle. And but I noticed that from my psychedelic experiences, that I've created some kind of pathways to be able to during my meditation now, 
I sit down, I start doing my mantra, I start to transcend. And then all of a sudden I see this pathway and I go, oh, I know this pathway. And I go down, I drop really, really deep in there where, you know, before maybe people have had a psychedelic experience, it takes a lot of practice in meditation to, you know, really get yourself to transcend as deep as you can possibly transcend to where, you know, you're no longer a human being, you're, you know, you're, you're the universe. Uh, I think we, we have the opportunity right, right now uh, to use these catalysts in a really interesting way. But I think everybody that goes through those uh, psychedelic experiences needs to be guided to have a daily practice of meditation, breathing, these things that can, you know, bring them back to that experience that they had. Um, it's a really, you know, they're kind of yin yang. It's like, you know, once you've got the skills, you can get there. And if, you know, some of the meditators, you know, I just say, I lived for two years with my family in Fairfield, Iowa, the home of the transcendental meditation movement. And I moved there because I saw how incredible this, you know, group effect was and the fact that all these thousands of people in this one little town were getting together and meditating interested in consciousness and right. i thought wow what a great place to you know take my kids and what a great place to live and, and try you know living that lifestyle and it was a great experience uh i do di you know again i do you know knock heads with some of the folks in that movement because they say oh you know you don't need anything you can just meditate and i say yeah i know, I know you can and maybe other people but you know we're living in a really you know, a PTSD generation right. and coming out of this coronavirus, I think PTSD is going to be accelerated even more. And yeah. And people just, you know, kind of need that breakthrough experience. And I know you probably know, like from those breakthrough meditation experiences, it can change your life. It can, you know, make that connection that you have with yourself inside so much more valuable and important that if you never get there, then, you know, it's just kind of like quieting, sitting down quietly, but that's totally different right. than, you know, getting to universal consciousness or, you know, being one. So I, I feel like we got this great, you know, opportunity right now coming out of coronavirus to say, Hey, here's a couple ways to, have a breakthrough and then you need this daily practice which to me is all about meditation because you know that's um you know like they say the whole point of your whole life is to know yourself so how are you going to know yourself if you're always out looking for you know validation in the physical realm it's just it's not there and i you know i've trained a lot of celebrities and business people and politicians uh, in meditation, and I've guided a bunch of them in their psychedelic experience, and they've just never been taught. That's the crazy part. It's not right. that they can't do it or that they can't handle it. It's just nobody ever taught them that the going inside is the most valuable thing you can do in your life. Oh, and I would imagine that just that very perception, one that we consider to be absolutely commonplace, is aberrant to many people. It's like, what do you mean going inside? I'm like, like the world is out there. I'm like, no. Yeah. That's one perception. Yes. <laughs> and people, you know, people always say, you know, like uh, in my first movie, Reality of Truth with Michelle Rodriguez, the actress, she plays, a, you know, an amazing role in that movie as, you know, having a transformation right there on film. And, wow. you know, we trained her in meditation and some different techniques along with sitting with shamans that her and I did with some friends. And, you know, she's like, oh, I can't quiet this monkey mind I have down. It's just, it's going and going. And it's, you know, kind of like you have to see that you can calm it down, that even people, you know, that are, you know, have all this attention coming at them and all this creative power that they have to, to create, uh, those people, when train properly when given the right guidance they can quiet that mind down uh, we all have the opportunity it's like they say in transcendental meditation they're like 
your your mind wants to settle down you know that's its natural state so if you can give yourself the technique to do it it's what your mind wants to do anyways and so just you know fall along a little bit give you know give it some chances and um you know hopefully you get trained in the right way so that you 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 feel that direct experience at least once so that you can then you know have that path and follow that in there it's it's totally doable for everybody but i think you know like you you know one of the things that's most intimidating about meditation is that it's so easy that that's what makes it so difficult you know you want to believe that there's all this magic things and you know techniques and that. no it's just it's so simple really like that's what's so difficult for people to accept and to you know be with it and i really have to tell people that very thing but not so much in a way that i am insulting them in a way because so many mm-hmm. people have this built up perception of what meditation is and when i tell them i, I mean even reluctant to tell them that it's easy because something that they've struggled with so long and it was, you know, to tell them basically it's so easy. And if you're not getting it, then you're really not that way. You're not that mm-hmm. with it. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Of course, that's not the reality at all. It's just yeah. they, to your point, they've just built it up so much in their head that they've created this like entity out there that's so high that they can never reach it. And the goal is to try and let them know just to your point, absolutely everybody can. And to your point again, the mind does want to calm down. And the only thing that makes that not possible, well, it's always possible, but difficult is the fact that we've got millions and millions of years of hereditary um, beliefs, uh, you know, fight or flight, and, and those are definitely biological principles. But the very thing of what is fear um, we put all these things out there and you think, well, no, my mind doesn't want to be calm. It's got to take, keep me safe. It's got to keep me well fed. It's got to keep me this, 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 and everybody's looking outside instead of looking in. Yeah, it's so true. You know, it's even like a lot of times I see online, these guided meditations and you know, they, they're, they have the best intent, but to right. me, it's like, if you're doing a guided meditation, then that means your mind is still on the you know, conscious level, it's having this conscious experience and you're trying to dip into the unconscious. Right. So, you know, I think a lot of people are like, they've done those types of meditations like, yeah, it was, you know, it was relaxing or whatever, but I didn't get enough out of it. So meditation doesn't work for me, you know? And the reality is, um, you know, that's kind of like to me, pop culture of trying to, you know, guide somebody through something. It's not, it's not for, you to be guided it's for you to you know get in there and know yourself and that you know is just you know like we're saying it's kind of you know so much so many years and decades and generations of being you know taught all these external ways to find satisfaction and um you know it kind of brings me to like my underlying core message that i'm all about these days which is that i think Right now, we're having this empathy crisis in the world. And by that, I mean that a lot of people care and they want to, you know, help, but they really can't put themselves in other people's shoes and have extended amounts of empathy to understand what that person is going through. So question is, how do you get more empathy instantly? And the only way I've ever seen that happen is that somebody has a near-death experience, or somebody has some type of catalyst that breaks them through. And when they come out, they just have more empathy. They're able to actually put themselves into other people's shoes. And I think if we had enough people, a critical mass of people with more empathy, we could solve any problem that we have as a society really easy. We would just sit down and, okay, we got to fix the water problem okay well let's think about it and people with empathy could say oh what about the person who's living across the world right now right. oh what about the people who are living 50 years from now they could have that type of consciousness that would allow us to you know at a critical mass you know solve these things and i think meditation the group effect the group effect is very powerful in meditation it's powerful in you know psychedelic experiences like ayahuasca and things where 
you know, quite literally, you're having this group effect and it's, it's incredible. Um, so yeah, I've, I've had it, you know, in, in Fairfield, Iowa, when you go there and I would urge anybody to go there that has any interest in consciousness or meditation to see what's happening there. But it's like you drive into town and all of a sudden you just feel this feeling where you're like, wow, you know what, what's going on? I just feel kind of a little more relaxed. And it's that palpable, huh? It's yeah, it's really, you know, you got a thousand men meditating in a dome together every day and a thousand women and they typically have over a thousand men from India on their own campus in this town, just wow. chanting for world peace eight hours a day. That's so and cool. it's, it's so palpable. So when you sit down to meditate in Fairfield, Iowa, even if you're just, you're in the woods or you're in your house and you sit down, it's like, whoosh, you tap into this whole field that's happening and you're like, wow, that was an incredible meditation. And, uh, you have to be trained a certain way to go inside that dome and be part of that direct, that experience. But uh, after the meditation in there, people call in on a video chat they have for years uh, and they talk about their number one experience as they call it, uh, their peak experience. And you listen to some of these people's experience. It's like, wow, that's so incredible. You know, it sounds like exactly like a peak experience I had in, my meditation or in a psychedelic experience or right. wow like i want to have that like i need to go deeper because that's the most beautiful thing i think i've ever heard in my life and so it's it's fun to be around a group when you're doing these things because you get your own experience but you're also get elevated by that group effect and I think one of the things that, and we're going to talk about it, in fact, we probably should talk about it now, is one of the things that intrigues me is uh, the psychedelic aspect of meditation. I haven't experienced it, but you and I talk about pretty off the cuff about these experiences we've had. And I think many people would be like, what is that like? I'm like, that's why I want to meditate. And part of me says, to some point, it's like, I can't guarantee that it'll happen, but with a consistent practice, you're going to get closer. I mean, you've been meditating for 30. I've been, you know, 30 plus as well. So um, it's second nature to us. But many people, one of the things that gets in their way is the desire to transcend uh, now. You know, our culture mm. says, do it now. Yes. <laughs> it has to happen yes. now. Whereas you and I are just like, you know, we've had decades of meditating. And yeah. if I think about the experiences that I've had that were transcendent, I'd probably say that maybe about 20 in 30 years, uh, yeah. which is a lot, but there's a lot that goes to that. So talk to me and talk to us about the route or the, the path of uh, introducing psychedelics into a meditation, which comes first, which comes after, after how is it um, regulated and monitored? Yeah, that's a really amazing question because this is, uh, this is the yin yang. And for me, um, you know, when you have that transcendental experience in the meditation, even though it's only, let's say 20 times over 30 years, it's like when you come back out of that meditation or you come back out of another meditation, it's like you're walking in Zen, you know, and to your Zen uh, commuter, it's like you're walking in Zen and you're carrying that ex transcendental experience into your life, your relationships, your health, your community. And people are feeling that vibration and that's really powerful uh, that that happens. And so, you know, like you said, we're in this instant society, everybody wants it right now. And so for that reason, I say, hey, we probably have to lean a little bit heavier right now on these psychedelics because mm, uh, once somebody has that direct experience of going inside and transcending to a point where they're, you know, they're, basically feeling like they're everything and they're nothing and that it, it's so grounding in your consciousness to say wow you know what this is this is where i'm going to get my answers from this is where i'm vibrating at my proper frequency um that it you, you it you carry that forward so even again you might do psychedelics one time and that may be enough for you for the rest of your life, for you to just meditate, do your thing, carry that forward. It may be that, you know, these psychedelics all have a different 
effect in a dip in a way. So, you know, there's opportunities if let's say you have an addiction uh, profile, you might need to do ibogaine, which is an African root that's been known to break addiction, heroin addiction, meth addiction in a single, you know, 12 hour session. Uh, if you are disconnected from nature, which a lot of people are because they're living in the city and they never even put their feet on the grass or the sand. Right. Uh, they may need to do San Pedro to instantly connect them to nature. Um, and most recently, I've been working with uh, what I think is going to be the Western medicine approach to going inside, which is a substance called ketamine. And ketamine is actually a FDA approved medication. It's a crystal. They put some salts together and this ketamine crystal grows and they take that crystal and you uh, put that inside of yourself. They usually use a, medically, they use a intramuscular shot or an IV over a 45 minute period. Mm -hmm. And you go into a state of present moment awareness that state that you're trying to get to in your meditation or, you know, where it's, you're in the present moment. There's no future. There's no past. It's just the present moment. And if you're in there for a half an hour, you can live a thousand lifetimes in that period. And you can look at things in your own life from a third party perspective. And a lot of times when you look at things in a third party perspective, you're like, wow, you know what? That's, that happened to me, but that's not me. And that alone can be, you know, change your whole life, that experience. So I think, you know, we as a Western culture, what I like about it, about ketamine is that a lot of people are going to go in for depression, anxiety, PTSD, mm -hmm. needing a real solution. They sit down, they get the ketamine, boom, now they're in present moment awareness. And when they come back out of that, now, they're, they want to meditate, they want to live, they want to breathe. And, you know, this ketamine is, is totally incredible, because the number one side effect is it breaks suicidal ideation. And so you think about that, like, how could something break your suicidal thoughts in one session? And, you know, the science on it is that what what's happening is that the ketamine, uh, you have an area of your brain called the default mode network. And you have a, uh, a mechanism in there called your lateral habanula. And what that's doing is it's recording all the stress that you've ever had in your entire life. And when it gets to be too much, <clears throat> it goes into, it, it's a tipping point and it goes into a totally different brain state called burst mode. And when it goes in burst mode, it shuts off your dopamine production. So you're getting no dopamine, you're getting no happiness, you're getting no motivation to do anything. And the first time you do the ketamine, it takes your brain out of that brain state. All of a sudden you start to get the dopamine. You're like, wow, you know what? I feel good. I, I want to go to the gym. I want to meditate. I want to, you know, do some art, you know, and how could that happen? One time is you, you wipe that uh, brain state and then the science on the ketamine says when it metabolizes, it turns into this hydroxy norketamine, which actually builds new neural pathways in your brain wow. around trauma and depression. So then after that, it's a lot easier to sit down and meditate because you're not running these patterns of <clears throat> I'm a failure, I'm a drug addict, I disappointed my family, nothing works out, you know, nobody loves me. It's like those patterns have a new pattern and it's set by this is who I am. This is my vibration. Mm -hmm. You know, it's almost like it's setting you back to your original vibration before you were disrupted by society and everybody telling you to do this and that and this. So it's, to me, it's all about frequency and vibration. And I think mm -hmm. you can drop into your original frequency through meditation. But if you're having trouble, there are these catalysts that are very safe and very effective in this modern society to drop you in there and give you that, that at least a glimpse. So, you know, it's there and you know that you can return back to that. And it's also 
amazing to see how, or it, it makes sense that it would cure or at least deal with suicidal ideation. Because if you're so grounded in this moment, I mean, when you're suicidal or depressed, what are you thinking about? Mistakes you've made in the past, worries you have in the future. But if you're in this moment, like I say, all the time, there's no stress in this exact moment right now. Yes. Uh, so it's amazing. So true. So true. Yeah, one, of, one of the things that's really incredible about ketamine, and this, again, probably can only be uh, appreciated in the direct experience of it. But what happens for those people who are suicidal is it's almost like a, a very advanced technology where while you're in that present moment state, you know, usually when people are suicidal, it's like they either think, okay, I either kill myself or I continue to do what I'm doing, which is just too painful. Right. But when you're in the ketamine, it opens up these, you know, 10 more option sets to you. And you're looking at it, you're going, oh, you know what? I like doing that. And if I did that, it could potentially lead to that. And like, I have all these different things. I'm not, I'm not going to kill myself like that. Like I got all these options. Right. So it's, it's really powerful to like have that realization for yourself. And then to, when you walk out of that, you know, you're carrying it like a meditation, like one of those peak number one experiences. And, um, you know, I even there's a, like, if you look at a brain scan of somebody uh, doing ketamine or under the influence of ketamine, you can see that it's not a hallucinogenic. It's not, you're not having these hallucinations. What it is, is it's a dissociative. So it's dissociating your left and your right brain and allowing them to interact in a way that they usually don't and without your ego involved. And I know in meditation, you do see more firing in the right brain, which is like your uh, evolutionary brain. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you look at the ketamine brain, it's 80% of the brain is firing. It's like, this is the limitless drug that everybody's looking for going, oh, we gotta find that. And it's like, it's here, it's safe. And we just need to educate people that this is a way to unlock your brain and allow you to, you know, create a pattern that fits with who you are right now and this present moment and how you're interacting in the present moment. And then, of course, meditation. Every time you go to meditate, it's just an easier and a deeper experience because you have these built pathways. How long have you been? working with uh, ketamine and with psychedelics, how did you become uh, aware of them and how long have they been around? Um... Yeah, I, you know, I was lucky at a young age. I had like everybody else, you know, maybe you do some experimentation, just having fun and things like that. And, and I had some decent experiences in my youth with them, but just really recreationally. And later on, um, you know, maybe a decade ago, I started to have this sort of spiritual midlife crisis where I realized, you know, I'd just done everything that society told me to do, go to school, get a job, make money, have a family, and then you're going to be totally happy and fulfilled. And I was sitting there like, okay, I did it all, but let's go, let's go happiness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I, and I had, I had, I had some happiness, but I just, I knew there was something deeper right. and more aligned with my frequency. So I started to say, how could I try these, you know, catalysts in a way that's not recreational, but it's more about trying to help myself to get more in touch with myself. And I had a, an experience that I describe as my most life changing experience that I'll describe to you, which was, I had an experience where I was basically out on the edge of the universe, looking at the universe like God might look at the universe. And I was pretty shocked by it. I was, you know, nervous. I was shocked. And I heard this voice, a God voice said to me, do you know how you're breathing right now? And I, I thought about it and I was like, no, I don't know how I'm breathing. And it said, do you know how you're growing your hair? You're doing it, but do you know how? And I, I was like, no, I don't know. And it said, if you don't know how you're breathing, then what makes you think I need your help? And I was like, wow, that's so true. Like, I, if I don't breathe for two minutes, I die. I don't even know how I'm doing that. Like, how can I be upset that 
these people aren't listening to me and this isn't how it's like, I don't even know how I'm breathing. And the, and then God said that this is perfect. You see, it's perfect and just enjoy it. It's, it's there for you to enjoy. And I came out of that and I was just, I it totally, you know, relieved me from having to worry about this or, you know, dream about how I'm going to fix this because it's like, I literally don't know how I'm breathing. So how is it that I can think that I can do anything other than appreciate the moment and try to, you know, get to even deep, you know, get to that point again where I can have that type of deep experience. Right. So that, that changed everything. And then, you know, having the experience of going to Peru, uh, which I documented in my film, The Reality of Truth with a group of friends and having that group experience of being with the shaman and sitting in the jungle and taking a medicine that they've been using for millennia to get in touch with themselves. Um, you know, that was incredible. And the fact that in that experience, there was the shaman and his assistant, me, Michelle Rodriguez, a bunch of our friends, there was 13 of us, including the shaman and his assistant. And this ayahuasca that we took, this vine that comes from the jungle, uh, that's been said to have this feminine god spirit with it um we had we all had our own incredible experiences but you know seven hours later or so in the same moment we all came out of it in this one moment it was like the ayahuasca energy just left the room and we all looked around and we we're like did you just come out you oh my god like our minds were totally blown we were like how can it be that we all just came out at the same moment and it was that group effect where you know, even when we were in it, we were using ESP to communicate with each other and to, you know, try to comfort each other in some rough moments that right. all of us had at one point or another. So was, you know, this is like, you know, when you get really serious about trying to know yourself and go deep, whether that's in, you know, through meditation and, you know, in transcendental meditation, they have these, this Siddha program where they, you know, teach that teach you to do deeper and deeper and deeper meditations. And it's a, a extensive training where you're meditating for weeks at a time. Um, you know, those experiences that you experience are the most profound of your life. And some of those psychedelic experience, same thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I came back from Peru, I started telling everybody, oh my God, you got to go to, you know, sit with a shaman and everything. And, you know, people were like, you know, that really needed it, that had addiction or depression or something. They were like, Zappy, forget about it. Like, there's no way my family's going to let me go to the jungle. They will put me in a mental institution if I tell them <laughs> I'm doing that, you know? So I was like, oh, I got to find a Western medicine approach to this. And that's when I found ketamine and realized that, hey, here is this really safe opportunity for Western people who, you know, are comfortable going to a doctor's office and having you know, that experience. Um, but the way that they found out that ketamine was, was doing this before they studied it at Yale University, uh, and basically before they showed that this is the biggest breakthrough in mental health that's ever happened, mm -hmm. um, what was happening was they were using it on the battlefield as, a, as, a, as an anesthetic. When somebody would have, you know, an amputation happen in the battlefield, they would give them the ketamine, then they would, let's say, cut off their, their legs and here's this person and the next day in the uh in the infirmary uh the person be sitting there and all of a sudden they crack a joke and the people were like wait a minute this guy hasn't cracked a joke in two years and he just got his legs cut off like what's going on here right. and they realized that something in the ketamine was part of that experience and then yale university did a study where they realized that it's sort of a less is more type of situation where instead of giving a high dose that puts you out if you give somebody a low dose where they can stay in that present moment awareness and do work, and then afterwards they can properly metabolize the ketamine and build some good neural pathways, mm -hmm. that that's really the opportunity. And so I've been like thrilled to find that uh, for myself, for my family, for my friends. It's just really great because like, I know I could say to people if they're really, you know, in a dark place, Hey, you could meditate your way out of this, 
but it just, you know, it's hard and I would right. probably have to sit with them 24 hours a day to make that happen. And with somebody who's really on the, in a bad place. So to have these catalysts that you know are going to take you to present moment awareness. And what I love about the ketamine is it's a, it's a crystal, you know, it's totally clean. So it doesn't have the legacy like a plant might have based on where it was grown and who, you know, who brewed it or something like that. This is just clean slate. And as a lot of people know with crystals, you can even put, you know, good energy on top of that. Mm -hmm. And so people wind up, you know, really never having a bad trip, like they say with the ketamine, because it's, it's almost got these bumpers on it. If you try to get negative, it bumps you back into the center. If you try to go manically positive, it pushes you back. So you're just in this easy place where you can do a lot of work. And thank God, you know, this exists because um, it's a real, it's a real breakthrough. What are the, um, you had mentioned it earlier, are there any concerns about addiction or is that more, so it's not available, if somebody had an addictive personality, would you still be able to say, okay, you can, but we have to modify it in such a way, or would you basically say, maybe not for you? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, this is, um, of all the people who've ever come in for treatment-resistant depression, nobody's ever gotten addicted to the ketamine. Mm. If you if you have somebody that's in an addicted state and they're abusing drugs and you hand them a bottle of ketamine, they're going to abuse it. It'll be gone by tomorrow morning. Right. So it's it's important that you give it to somebody in the right context, that they're guided properly. But, you know, in general, uh, this these are very non-addictive substances because, you know, even meditating super deep, you know, when you transcend like that and you hit that spot, you're you're blown away, but at the same time, there's a fear in that where you're like, oh, ah, maybe I should come out of this. What's happening? I feel like I'm freezing and hot and, uh, you know, and, and if you're not trained or you're not in the, the right space, you're going to try to pull yourself even out of the most beautiful meditation right. ever. So you just, with the, the right set and setting, as they say, you're going to have a good experience. They always start people really low with the ketamine. And, you know, it's, it's not the, the holy grail in that right. like do it once you're no longer you're cured of everything forever. yeah you're great <laughs> but you know it is very stabilizing it can reset your frequency to a place that you're going to be you know if you have a daily practice you could be good the rest of your life maybe just do a you know a regular booster treatment a few times a year or something like that if you felt like you were slipping but you know, I would say there's other plant medicines like ibogaine, this African root that have incredible effect on addiction and should be used um, for people that fit that kind of profile. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I just finished a movie with uh, Lamar Odom, the basketball player, a new documentary. It's called Lamar Odom Reborn. We're hoping it's streaming in the next, you know, 30, 60 days, something like that. We're bringing it out now to the, the different uh, distribution folks. Uh, but in that movie, it follows a two-year psychedelic intervention that I did on Lamar. And, you know, a lot of people don't know, you know, they see him, the basketball player, the Kardashian, and they're like, wow, what a, you know, fabulous life. Like, what could he possibly be depressed about or have anxiety about? And why is he addicted? Uh, is he just you know, escaping or something. But, you know, you realize that he's had a lot of trauma in his life. His mother died of cancer when he was 12 years old. You know, he watched that happen. His grandmother passed away, who raised him. He had a six month old son that died. Um, you know, a lot of trauma. And so, stuff. you know, yeah, he never, um, he'd always just, yeah, process that. And he'd always gotten a lot of confirmation of millions of people cheering for him and stuff. And then he would go back to his house and be sitting there and he would need to numb himself in some way. And so uh, he'd never done any psychedelics. He'd never meditated anything really like that. And so I convinced him to try the ketamine to kind of triage him and give him that experience of going inside. After his first treatment, he said, you know, I just never felt that good inside before. I never like felt like mm, just so in tune with myself and 
I gave him a few more ketamine treatments over time. And then I suggested to him that he come down to uh, Mexico with me and do a private ibogaine treatment. And this ibogaine is this African root that can break a heroin addiction in 12 hours, a meth addiction, a cocaine addiction, alcoholism. Uh, and basically what it's doing is it's giving you a reset mentally and a reset physically. Mm. And um, it is, like I said, it's the least addictive substance on the planet. Like when you are done with this, you, you know, never want to see this again in your life. But at the same time, uh, it wipes your prefrontal cortex so that you and it detoxes all out all of the um, opiates and things that are in your body. So when you're done with this 12 hour session, even if you were smoking two packs of cigarettes, shooting heroin, you're going to be like, you're going to have no cravings. You have no detox that took place. You're just, you're done. And so you have a window of time that they typically describe as, you know, two to three months where you're in this ibogaine glow and you're just, you're good. And then you have to change your lifestyle uh, so that you can last for years or a lifetime. And Lamar, he felt so good after I gave him the ibogaine treatment and the doctors did that uh, like 48 hours later, we were driving back from Mexico to Los Angeles and we're in the van and Lamar said, I feel so good mentally and physically He's like, I think I can make a comeback in professional basketball. And we we're all like, wow, that's pretty crazy. And his uh, bodyguard uh, trainer was with us, good friend of his. And the guy was like, Lamar, take it easy, dude. He's, like, he, yeah. He's like, you'd have to work out for four hours a day. You can't be smoking marijuana. And Lamar's like, I know what I got to do. He's like, I'm doing it. And we we're all like, wow, that's cool to hear, you know. And three months later or so, he wound up playing in a professional tournament in Dubai, uh, despite that, you know, when he had a coma, he had 12 strokes, six heart attacks, kidney damage, liver failure. You know, he was, they told him he might never walk again and certainly never be normal. And after that ibogaine, he was just like, he was so strong. He's like, I, I didn't fear death. Like I was supposed to, I've already died. And so what could I fail? I knew I wasn't going to be the exact player that I was in my prime. I'm 40 years old and I had this experience, but like I had nothing to lose. And to see a guy live that rocky experience and to, you know, say it 48 hours after having this plant medicine, right. it was like, wow. And then we worked on meditation and breathing and things. And, you know, you just, now it's been, it's been well over a year since that Ibogaine experience. And, uh, you know, he's brought, he's reunited with his dad, who's been on methadone for years, brought him to do ketamine treatments, brought his ex-wife and his kids to do ketamine treatments. And, you know, they just say he's, all, he's just present now, you know, he's in our life and he's in a present state of mind. And it's like, if that's like the ultimate confirmation, if somebody's, you know, saying that somebody feels present, that's, right. wow. So if it's, if all these benefits are so uh, abundant, how many doctors are coming on board with that? Is it, is it a, a battle to get people to say, to look at this, to look at the science, to look at the test, to look at all the different uh, variables to say, yeah, this is, uh, this is something to think about? Or are people still at the kind of skeptic, like, eh, that sounds kind of like a little weird? Yeah, it's, you know, it, it, these things take a little bit of time. I think we've it's, it's lack of education as opposed to some conspiracy, right. you know, like meditation. It's like, it's so simple. It's right here. We've just never been trained. And some of these catalysts are right here. We've just never been educated. So a Western medicine doctor, you know, very few of them know about plant medicine and its effectiveness. You know, most doctors have never even really been trained in, you know, dietary health. So right. this is, it's, it's easily accessible. It's like we're in the education phase right now. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm just gonna drink some water. Sure. Um, you know, and, and people know that this is going to be a very transformative experience. So there's a lot of, you know, hesitation, even myself, the first time I got the opportunity to do ayahuasca, I put it off for a year, 
you know, every time that person would call me and say, Hey, I'm doing a full moon ceremony. And I'd be like, Oh shoot tonight or tomorrow. Oh, I, I got, got this thing. thing. You know, you know, <laughs> can't do it. A next, let me know next time, you know? So there's a resistance based on, you know, lack of knowledge, uh, some propaganda that's happened from the, you know, pharmaceutical industry, um, from these different industries that, you know, they don't, you know, even religion and things like that. It's like, you know, a lot of times religion wants to be the buffer between you and God. And then when, if, when you realize that meditation puts you directly in touch with that, or these plant medicines might put you directly in touch and right. you don't need the middleman, they will spend a lot of money to disrupt that. Yeah. They don't and, like cutting out the middleman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, ketamine uh, had this, had this interesting situation up until really recently where it was you know, 50, 60 years old. So it was off patent. So there was no money to be made by any pharmaceutical companies. And they were just going into there at the time, the, the antidepressants, the SSRIs and these things. So they were like, let's not tell people about this $3 worth of medication. Let's have them, you know, work on their serotonin and all this. And it's like the ketamine is different. It's not blocking you from feeling. It's actually uh, engaging the entire brain and it's working on your, like I said, your default mode network, your GABA receptors and things like that. And so it's, I think it's going to happen really fast. I think this, you know, nature is very intelligent and it, you know, knows that people are suffering and it's bringing out these natural catalyst to help people out with these problems what we're having mentally and physically mm -hmm. and so you know just to that just to touch on that i i heard something you know recently where it really blew my mind about you know how intelligent plants are in nature and i was watching one of these nature channel shows and they were talking about these monkeys down in papua new guinea i'm sorry these bats these bats live in papua new guinea and they are fruit bats and they eat the fruit from the plants and then they drop the seeds or they, when they go to the bathroom, they drop the seeds and this is what's fertilizing and growing more plants and trees. And they said that the plants realized that what the uh, bats were doing and they adapted to make it easier for the bats to hold on to the trees. So wow, it's like, wow. wow, you know, that they, they, they would have the intelligence to, morph into a better situation that they understood this and then when you see you know these new movies coming out about mushrooms and mycelium um being uh like the network or the internet under the ground passing nutrients from plant to plant it's like this is a very intelligent nature that we have and again we don't even know how we're breathing so we shouldn't overly pretend we know how to fix people Right. Um, but we have to trust nature and, and part of that is, you know, going inside whatever way we need to. <clears throat> so we have all the solutions. It's just, you know, we need the education now because I can't believe they're not teaching edu uh, meditation in every school in the country. Right. Uh, in Fairfield, Iowa, there's a meditating school there and the P the kids meditate together, uh, twice a day in the morning and the afternoon, even in the college that they have, they have a kids from, you know, a thousand different, uh, I'm sorry, a hundred different countries right. and they meditate together and everybody's so cohesive. Everybody's so in tune with each other that you're, you're like, wow, you know, they're just, they're meditating together. That's all they're doing, but it creates so much empathy and right. so much understanding that it's it's really amazing to see. I mean, I really encourage people to go to this town. Um, and I want to give you one more data point on how powerful meditation is. Uh, in this town, there is this college, the Maharishi University of Management, and they teach a lot of international students come there uh, for postgraduate work in computer science, um, sustainable agriculture, sustainable building, and these are, you know, really sharp people. So uh, they recently, uh, Google and Microsoft and these guys, they had a hacking competition where they invited, you know, everybody in the world, all these programmers to uh, 
to a hacking contest and the winner got, you know, a significant amount of money. And so they, people went through the test, thousands of people, they narrowed it down to a few hundred. And then those people had a hacking contest uh, to, you know, figure out who is the best hackers in the world. And two kids from the university, one came in like seventh and one came in like ninth in the entire world as far as problem solving computer technology <clears throat> and um you realize in that that you know it was their ability to transcend and to think on a different level that was making them you know the top thinkers and able to do these problem solving in unique ways mm -hmm. that other people couldn't do <clears throat> there's a a poker player too, like a top, you know, I don't know, 25 player in poker. He grew up in this town because his parents were meditators. And, you know, when I see him play on TV or, you know, whatnot, uh, you think, wow, you know, he's so calm. He's so hard to read. He's impossible. Like there's no way to get this kid who's been meditating for 30 years since he's a kid <laughs> to shake this kid or rattle him. Even if there's $10 million on the line, he's just, He's unflappable and he could even read your energy better because if you start to, you know, get nervous or twitchy Twitch. or whatever, <laughs> he's going to, he's going to feel it. He's so right. in touch with his own nervous system that it's a very powerful competitive advantage. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. It's, it, I'm sure you've had similar circumstances as well. Obviously I know you have, cause we've talked about some of them, but that awareness of other people, that empathy, that it's not even, you know, some people would say, well, you're picking up on body language, you're picking up on uh, maybe something that you're saying, but there are times I see people and it's not even verbal, obviously, and you can just sense that there's something going on. If we think about energy, talking about energy, I think a lot of people talk about it, but not many people have the ability to experience it or have experienced it to know that when we have those moments of meditation where we are god for want of a better term uh and absolutely to the other end uh other end point nothing that community that connection of all life links you to all life and once you have those moments that you're kind of linked forever and it might not be on a very conscious level obviously i mean i've had moments that are very transcendent and for you know like hours i'm walking around i'm like wow this is uh it's kind of a reality that uh, I didn't expect and it's all an illusion, but I'm cool with it because I know where I belong, but mm -hmm. also having that awareness to know that you're not the only person and the guy down the street, um, everybody, the plant, the guy, they're all you. And yes. so when you have these moments, you can feel that energy. And so when we have those moments, either through meditation or with the assistance of psychedelics, I can, I can't imagine that anybody would come away from those, uh, instances without any, like, without transformative um, abilities or um, yeah. transformative. Um, yeah, and that and you know that's what, like what they say. That's the point of meditation. It's not to go inside and you know find total bliss. It's like to carry that bliss out into your waking reality. And so you know, to me, that's that's incredible. Uh, one of the other things I want to advocate for, you know, and again, I'm you know, taking the stance right now that we have an inalienable right to happiness. It's in the constitution at the beginning of the constitution. Right. It says you have an inalienable right to pursue happiness. Now, if there are catalysts out there naturally growing out of the ground that can tap us into that happiness, we are demanding the right to go into our mind. Mm -hmm. And we started a movement that I call the mind army. And to join that, you know, anybody can join. You don't have to do psychedelics. You can be a meditator and have gotten there. You can be, you know, inexperienced or experienced. But what it is, is we are just demanding the right to go inside our minds as deep as we want to and need to. Mm. And, you know, as human beings, I think we're naturally driven to explore. It's part of our DNA is to, you know, we explored the new world. We explored the West. We explored outer space but somehow they're telling us we can't explore inside our own mind, that's unacceptable right now. And when we are living through a depression epidemic, a suicide epidemic, an addiction epidemic, it's like 
you have to allow people if they can to go inside. They're not hurting anybody else. They're doing it with their own, you know, their own consciousness. And we need to demand that right right now. Right. And one of the things that uh, I think, you know, is probably going to be one of the biggest breakthroughs for everybody is that uh, psilocybin mushrooms, you know, what people could call magic mushrooms. Uh, when you take those, you have, you know, a transcendental experience. But when you microdose those things, when you're taking, you know, a tenth of a hit or a hundredth of a hit, you're taking a very small amount, but you're triggering some frequency inside yourself, mm -hmm. you can have this walking in Zen experience where you can, you know, play with your kids, you can drive a car, you can go do your work. You're not, you know, having some psychedelic experience. Right. You're just you're just basically taking some of these filters that you naturally have on that are filtering all the time and you take a few of those off. And now you're, you know, appreciating how beautiful nature is. You're appreciating the the moment that you're in with your family. And so I think these psilocybin microdose are going to be the biggest breakthrough that we have as a society on mass to be able to say, okay, here's an opportunity. Because for me, every time I microdose, I sit there and I, at some point I think, wow, you know, this is probably what people are trying to feel like when they do one of those antidepressants. This is what they want to feel. And the fact that we could do that, you know, so naturally and so safely, um, you know, we kind of need to demand the right to do it right now. And we need to, you know, encourage people to have the confidence. Um, and also, you know, I would say there's even some um, barriers that we need to bring down within the psychedelic community and the meditation community where, you know, people of color, people like Lamar, for example, he was always told, oh, don't do those psychedelics. You know, that's like white people drugs, you know. That is, if you have a bad experience and you start to freak out, you could get shot by a cop. You could be put in a mental institution the rest of your life. It's right. not the same as, you know, some, you know, white kid in the suburbs flips out and, you know, you got to go to therapy and your whole community is like, hey, we're behind you. It's all right. right. You know? right. So we have to create a very safe environment with no judgment. Right. Totally where inclusive. people can do this. Yeah, totally inclusive. And, you know, I think we have to fight for that right now. And that's what the Mind Army is all about. I would encourage everybody to, you know, join up this and just, you know, demand the right to be educated in these things. And I think um, whether you're getting there through meditation or through these plant medicines, um, we have to demand the education for our kids and say, you can't send these kids to school, put them through metal detectors, and then try to, you know, get traumatized as a kid by, you know, other kids and, and teachers like, every, like happens to everybody. And then we don't teach them how to calm themselves down and right. to breathe their way through it. I mean, that's just like, that's negligent in my opinion, as far as schooling goes. Right. It's good to see that there are uh, we still have a long way to go, obviously, but there are a variety of schools that are teaching meditation. Whenever I see one or hear about one, I'm like, sweet. But mm -hmm. I know that that's obviously the exception and not the rule. But yeah, it's happening. Like you're saying, it, it is happening. It's great to see. There's some anecdotal, you know, experiences that have been created where, you know, Transcendental Meditation Movement trained a school in Oakland, California, which really always had one of the biggest dropout rates and violence and um it was just a really one of the worst ranked schools in the country and it became one of the best ranked schools in the country and and they introduced um you know this quiet time as they called it and you know the kids just were able to settle themselves down they had the group effect um you know oprah winfrey talks about she comes to fairfield iowa you know from time to time and She's trained her whole staff in transcendental meditation, her whole entire leadership team. And she said, now I had the pleasure of meeting her when I was in Fairfield and hanging out a little bit. And she said, there's no more backstabbing. You know, everybody's just more congruent in what we're doing. And it's totally changed everything. And so when you see that, you know, these different examples, um, you know, we just need to 
push these out deep farther and further into society. Hopefully the schools can adopt this in the public school uh, program because it's just going to make the teacher's job easier, the administrators, the kids. It's like, you know, let's help ourselves in this moment, um, which has been great. And uh, I just want to tell you one other anecdotal story um, about getting into present moment awareness. And I have a, a fund, a nonprofit that's called the Ketamine Fund. Uh, I started it with a guy named Warren Gumpel, who's also a ketamine advocate like myself. Mm. And we decided, you know, we said, let's do a little clinical study and let's give veterans free treatments with ketamine because they need it, they deserve it, and they're in a really rough place. And, you know, the medicine that they're getting and is not working out right now for them. So in Utah, we gave away 400 treatments um, at a clinic there two veterans and there are testimonials you can see on ketaminefund.org but you have veterans who are on 22 medications suicidal homicidal down to no medications just doing you know a regular booster treatment ongoing of ketamine and you know the guy said i went home after my first treatment and i hugged my kids and I felt love for the first time in more than 10 years. Wow. You know, and you hear that, you're like, wow, you know, what veteran doesn't deserve that? What human being doesn't deserve that? Right. Um, another guy, you know, um, you know, again, traumatized from their war experience, uh, trying to self-medicate with drugs and alcohol. Right. And after his first ketamine treatment, he just said, I felt like I had this spring that I was always holding back and I was scared because if it released, I would go into rage or depression. And he's like, I was, my whole life, I was just holding it back. And he's like, after my first treatment, he's like, I wasn't holding the spring anymore. I didn't need to hold it. I was just there, you know? And so, you know, you see anecdotal things with meditation, with, you know, ketamine, with plant medicine, and you realize that we're really close, you know, in this right. pandemic, if anything, it's really accelerated people's need to get back to their own original frequency. And it's probably the silver lining that's going to come out of this is that, yeah, people are going to be a lot more traumatized, but they're going to be actively seeking ways to go inside like never before. Right. Right. So how can people follow all the things you're doing? So we're, we're, uh, we're actually uh, coming up on our hours. So I want to make sure that I respect your time, but I also definitely want you like, you're doing everything. So how do people follow you, Zappy? Yeah. Um, so a couple of ways, you know, you can check out some websites, zappy.com. You can check out uh, ketaminefund.org is, an, is a really good resource to check out. Mm. Um, Odumreborn.com is just right now a movie site, but we anticipate that's going to be a community uh, information, education, and access to some of these uh, techniques. But, you know, really, I hope that movie, because Lamar is such an incredible subject and he has an amazing transformation, I think he's going to wind up being the one of the poster children for talking about mental health. Right. And so when people see that movie and they get to witness him and see him go through that transformation, it's different than seeing me or, you know, some veteran even because you go, well, I don't know that guy. I have no idea what his life's about. But right. so many people feel like they know Lamar that when they see his transformation, they get to say, ah, okay, now I, that's somebody I know. And that's a, I see how his energy changed. And I think that that's going to be a, an amazing way for people to tap into what's possible right now. Now, can people, where can people see uh, the reality of truth? Oh, yeah. Okay. So the reality of truth is available for free on YouTube. Oh, sweet. Um, yeah. It's been watched over 6 million times now, Damn. which is really, uh, <laughs> feels really good. Um, it's also on Amazon Prime and it's on Gaia TV if people want to see it. But I would say, you know, go to YouTube. It's only an hour long, um, but we get a lot of letters from people, emails and things where people are like, this movie saved my life. I was going to kill myself. I wow. was totally in despair. And I didn't know that these opportunities existed. 
And now it's not only changed my life, but I've changed all these other people's lives with this information. And so, that, it, you know, it's, weird. yeah, it's a really, it feels really good at the same time. You know, it, it also feels like, wow, 6 million people, that seems like a lot, but you know, there's 300 million people in this country. There's 70 million or so that are suffering from depression, anxiety, addiction. You know, we need this to get this out as far and wide as we can. And, um, yeah, so I would urge anybody to check out the reality of truth and uh, see, you know, see Michelle Rodriguez and see, you know, you can see her transformation. You know, she comes in, you know, really cool, but with a little bit of an edge. And then you right. see her as she has these experience to soften and become more in line with her own frequency. And so to see that is just, um, you know, it's, it's, it's motivational to to say to yourself, you know what, she has more to lose maybe than I even do right now or Oprah Winfrey. You know, a lot of times I think one of the funniest things is people always go, I don't have time to meditate. I'm so busy. And then I go, I always say, are you more busy than Oprah Winfrey? And they're like, mm, no, probably not. I like that. <laughs> I'm like, all right, that's over. Um, so, you know, just there's that old saying where they say, if you don't have 10 minutes to meditate, meditate for 20 minutes. <laughs> exactly. I totally dig that. So, Zappy, yeah. What an absolute pleasure to have you. I, I feel like I've known you like my entire life. <laughs> ah, nice. Ditto. <laughs> Ditto. We probably we probably been hanging around in that in that field somewhere. Just you know, we know each other from the field. So absolutely, I totally feel that. Thank you. I appreciate what you're doing. This you know, talking about meditation and consciousness is like you know, these are the most important podcasts that there are out there. And so I love what you're doing, and uh, I support it hundred percent. Well, thank you so much. Between the work you're doing, the work I'm doing, we might have a whole country, a whole planet of people that are looking inside. Nice. Awesome. Sounds good. All right. Well, I will good be in touch you. with you later on. You have a great night and we'll be talking real soon. All right. Peace. Enjoy. Take care, man. Peace. You too.